Hello, I'm Andrea Lipinski. And I'm Keith DeCandido. Welcome to the 25th, yes, the 25th episode of The Chronic Rift. It's our silver anniversary. Tonight, we're going to look at Japanese animation and see what is so good about it in the first place. But first, a few things to help you cope with reality. First of all, we'd like to thank Grace Ann DeCandido, also known as The Mom. Uh, those of you who saw our holiday episode last December may remember her saying that she was going to be on our discussion of Ursula Le Guin, but anybody who watched last week's show will see that she wasn't on it. She was called away, but she did, was kind enough to write the introduction to the clip, uh, to the roundtable, that is. Uh, we thank you from the bottom of our feet. Christopher Hines is giving us the third book of his Paratwa saga, called simply Paratwa, the sequel to Liege Killer and Ash Ock. This has the Irian colonies trying to find a way to defend themselves against the oncoming Paratwa assassins. This book is published by St. Martin's and is available for $18.95 in hardcover. And now here with Omega Zone's latest is The Man in Black. Hi. First you're terrified by the curse. Then you are horrified by the curse too. Now it's back. Curse 3, The Blood Sacrifice. I never saw either of the first two Curse movies, so if you'll forgive me if I don't jump for joy at having seen the third one. This film deals with a powerful family and a tribal witch doctor's curse. It has a nice cover, but we all know what judging a book by its cover means. Cast for this film is worth a look with Christopher Lee and the ever-sexy Jenny Lee Harrison. Curse 3 is due to hit stores on May 1st and will price at $79.95. If you can get this with a friend, a twin pack will only cost you $120. At $60, it may be worth getting. Probably one of the strangest films to hit in New York in quite a while is Popcorn. It was on screen here for about three weeks. The story of a psychotic killer in an all-night movie marathon did re receive quite a bit of good publicity. And it got halfway decent reviews. The promo was pretty catchy. Popcorn. Buy a bag, go home in a box. Coming to stores May 29th at $90. Sorry, beta people. It's only being released in VHS. I was very surprised to learn that the late actor James Coco was into doing schlock horror movies. This week's It Came From Out of Nowhere to go directly to video title is The Chair. This film is about the spirit of a sadistic war prison warden who's placed into an electric chair by rioting inmates, sending him to an eternity of suffering. Of course, they later reopen the prison, and the spirit of the departed warden is still hanging around. It's a wonder like this film's come out of nowhere. $90 and available May 16th. Last week's show, which was taped three weeks ago, I mentioned that Warlock was being solicited on video without having opened in New York City. Well, they must have heard me. Warlock opened on April 8th. Isn't tape delay wonderful? For animation fans, the third volume of Robotech The Next Generation is being released by Palladium Books and will be available at better comic establishments. The price is a very reasonable $29.95. Just for you George Romero fans, the color remake of Night of the Living Dead is being released, coming out April 17th at $90. Need a little more cheap schlock in your life? How about Slumber Party Massacre 3? Best thing about this tape seems to be the cover art. Three scantily clad California co-eds look appropriately fearful of a serial killer with a drill. Now I know what they mean by exploitation. Now we move to a film with a pseudo-glasnost plot. A good cast and probably absolutely no idea what it's doing. The film is called Firehead. Recently in the stores at $89.95, this film has actually strives to have a plot. The Department of Defense chief who plans to use a Russian demolitions expert who also happens to be a pyrokinetic to start World War III and revitalize the U.S. defense industry. Christopher Plummer, Chris Lemon, and Martin Landau score, star. The only reviews I've seen on this film are all from video magazines, and we know they never dump on advertisers. I'm the Man in Black, and this has been the Video Review. Don't forget that all the videos the Man in Black spoke about are available at Omega Zone and other area specialty stores. And here with the comics is that crazy DeCandido boy. Thank you, Andrea. And welcome to Comic Art Commentary, where the elite and the not-so-elite meet. Next month, Kitchen Sink Press will be releasing Will Eisner's latest graphic novel called To the Heart of the Storm. This is Eisner's latest uh, from Kitchen Sink. He's been doing them since 1985. Eisner's one of the grandmasters of the field. He created the spirit in the 1940s as a newspaper supplement and has been one of the most influential artists in the entire comics field. His previous graphic novels include The Building and The Dreamer, which were both pretty dreadful, uh, A Contract with God and Other Stories, which was uneven but good, and A Life Force, which was quite good. To the Heart is probably his best work to date. It's an autobiographical tale like The Dreamer, but where The Dreamer focused on his early life in the comics industry, To the Heart of the Storm focuses on his life growing up as the son of Jewish immigrants in New York City during the Depression. It's already received some rave reviews uh, in the Comics Buyer's Guide and a sort of lukewarm review in Publishers Weekly but it's his best scripted and probably his best art to date. This week's comic in review 
is The Six Voyages of Lone Sloan by Philip Douillet, translated by Randy and Jean-Marc Lefissier and published by NBM. This is the latest in NBM's Stories of the Fantastic series. The last one was Fever and Urbicand, which I reviewed back in September. It was by Benoit Peter and Francois Chuitain and was quite good. This is garbage. Okay, picture the worst science fiction B-movie you can possibly imagine. Yes, worse than the Flash Gordon movie serials. Now picture something infinitely worse than that, and you might approach the putrescence of the six voyages of Lone Sloan. The dialogue is full of expository silliness and tiresome posturing. The plots have all the 30s and 40s standards, space gods, sexy female sentient computers, cheesy androids, large ugly warlord bad guys that challenge the tough guy hero to something, and of course, the tough guy hero triumphs in the end, grimacing the entire time. It's horrible. The art is too busy. There's too much going on and there's no focus. There's nowhere for your eye to fall. It's just a glutinous mass and the panels don't even follow logically. The press release material says that Drouillet was is a very strong influence on the other French artist, Mobius. And I can accept that. There's some, some of uh, Drouillet in Mobius, but, uh, well, Neil Adams influenced Bill Sienkiewicz, too. I know who I'd rather look at. Lone Sloan is a good argument for putting labels on comics. This one should read, warning. This comic contains material that may be deemed offensive to people with taste or at least a rudimentary sense of aesthetics. This, the Six Voyages of Lone Sloan is available from NBM, 64 pages, $14.95 in paperback, and is available both at comic shops and directly by mail from the publisher. That's it for Comic Art Commentary this week. In closing, I'd just like to ask the powers that be at DC, do we really need another Superman book? Really? That's it. Back to you, Andrea. Thank you, Jared. Um, I know you didn't like the book, but can you say the names of the authors again? Philippe Drouillet. He's French. Yeah, no, I, I like it when you speak French. Oh, okay. Okay. Now it's time for our memorable moment. Oh, boy. And we have a letter here of somewhat dubious origin. <laughs> <clears throat> Dear Andrea and the other guy, too. That's him. I first heard of your show from the review in the Village Voice. I wasn't too impressed until I saw the award show and your new host, Andrea Lipinski, or as I like to call her, the goddess. The Chronic Rift, the Chronic Rift has become one of my favorite things on TV because I get to see her, yes, with a capital H, every week. One of my other favorite things is the short-lived show Probe, created by Isaac Asimov and starring Parker Stevenson. This was a great show that should have been given a chance. I'd like to submit a memorable moment from the episode, Plan 10 from Outer Space. Now I'll get to see my two favorite TV things, Andrea and Probe together. Andrea and Probe together. Yeah. Do you realize how that sounds? I'm not going to say Oh that. my gosh. Oh yes. I'd like Andrea to say my name slowly. It would just make my year. Keep up the good work. This was a letter from Sydney Temple. And canceling so. those credit cards. Good, I was afraid you weren't taking this seriously. What are these things supposed to do? Catch pretzel or scare him away? Probably doesn't exist. Speaking of that, I've been meaning to ask you about something you said last night. Great. Right. If you ever have kids, are you going to tell them there's a Santa Claus? No. No? No, I wouldn't want to encourage a belief in a mythical being. But you'd be robbing them of one of the great joys of childhood. No, I'd be fine with Adam. Austin, your parents? Me. I set a trap. Motion-sensitive camera he never showed. Tooth Fairy, Easter Bunny Boogeyman, I disproved them all by the time I was six. But kids are supposed to believe in that stuff. You ruined it for yourself. No, I didn't. I just used my imagination in other, more productive ways. Like what? Build a castle. You built a castle? In my head. I dug the moat, cut and mortared every stone, hammered every nail. Hung the gates, filled the cisterns, laid the cobblestone. I even carved the benches in the chapel. It took five years. I didn't need Santa Claus. So who brought you your Christmas presents? Mailman. I always ask for a gift certificate from IBM. Uh, Mr. Templeton, we have two books. One is Smart Dragons, Foolish Elves, which is edited by Alan Dean Foster. And the other is Cities in Flight, Volume 1, by James Blish. And thank you very much for your letter. And uh, I will give you the books and nothing else. Many of us have been watching Japanese animation for years and not known it because a lot of American animation is made in Japan. But what we see on our TV screens and on our movie screens 
is just a fraction of the ability of Japanese animators. Tonight, we'll be examining the fantastic world of Japanese animation from its beginnings to its present. It's a unique and different form of entertainment and well worth watching. With Keith and me to discuss this are, on my far right, Felix Rodriguez, a freelance illustrator who was on our past episodes of Covered Art and Alternative Comics. Um, on my next right, Joe Duffy, a comics writer and editor who was on our past episode of Doctor Who and also on our Roundtable Awards. Joe translates Akira comics for, uh, for, for Ekic for epic comics. Um, then on the other side of Keith, we have Robert Fenelon, the vice president of Minstrel Press, which publishes magazines on Japanese animation. Uh, Joe, you get my first question. Um, as an American who's not very familiar with Japanese animation, I've been seeing a lot of it recently to prepare for the show. And one of my, the, the first thing that struck me um, that was that seemed strange to me was that a, uh, to me a majority of the characters in Japanese um, in the Japanese films or in the TV series seem to have very large eyes, and um, I, it just it seemed strange to me. It seemed as almost as though they were trying to imitate a Western culture, whereas in Western animation you don't see them trying to imitate an Eastern culture. And I want to know if this was. Well, um, I think that what you're seeing in Japanese anim animation is not an attempt to westernize the characters. The Japanese animation industry really got going after World War II, mm -hmm. and they took some of their visual cues from the most popular American animation of that time. Um, mm -hmm. Notably, the best known of the early Japanese cartoonists and illustrators, Osamu Tezuka, mm -hmm. um, has said, um, in fact, Robert pointed this out to me, that he was very influenced by the uh, Fleischer animated Popeye cartoons mm -hmm. and also um, I know that he was very influenced by Walt Disney's Pinocchio. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and look at that material, American animation at that time, the style was called Big Foot and it might as easily have been called Big Eye. Right. And because Japanese animation became more successful um, from that period, whereas American animation was kind of dwindling, they stayed with what had been very successful and popular for a long time. The large eyes, the uh, overall exaggeration, the almost a childlike distortion of the characters. Mm -hmm. Although, as a matter of fact, in the most recent movies, they seem to be toning that down a little bit. Eyes are getting smaller and uh, body proportions are getting somewhat more realistic. They don't seem particularly exaggerated. I mean, at least the Japanese animation that I've seen is its quite the opposite, except, I mean, it's Part of what's jarring about about the large eyes is that you're expecting, at least I was expecting, Japanese characters for some reason. So, uh, but to the Japanese, yeah. those are Japanese characters. Um, mm. They, the Japanese, do not perceive themselves the way. Um, there's a sort of a Caucasian and a, a Western and European perception of the Japanese as looking fairly uniform, and um, that is that's kind of a prejudice that that we've had. 
but they do not perceive themselves as uniform. They perceive themselves as having a great deal of variety in appearance in terms of coloration that, uh, you know, because they're exposed every day to, to each other, they do not all look alike to each other. Um, and so they, because animation is a medium of kind of minimalist expression in order to give cues to the, uh, to the viewer about who a character is, they stylize everything intensely. And uh, so what we may perceive as a character looking European is actually just, he has to look different than another character. And they mm -hmm. take advantage of a whole bunch of facial types and coloring types. I mean, uh, you could talk about their hair color. In the movies, mm -hmm. it's not all black and brown the way it actually is for most of the Japanese people. It is all the way from white to jet black and strays into the pastels. And this is just a way of making the characters look different and taking advantage of the, the range of the animation color palette. Right. Yeah, and some of their uh, science fiction shows, like uh, Z Gundam, Gundam, Double Z, a lot of the aliens are different color hair, different color styles, and they vary in different in uniforms to stylize uh, different life forms or different life of characters they want to uh, have images of. And if a certain character is popular, a certain style is popular, it sort of floats over to other uh, shows and other presentations in their, That's in true. their form. A lot of the male heroes tend to look similar. They have the same kind of hair, you know? <laughs> well, if you saw the stylization when I showed you the Lupin episodes right. and how yeah. uh, you have four different characters, but sometimes their clothes are very similar. It's very European, except for the only Japanese character in there was Goyman. Right. One thing I noticed, um, is that a lot of the stuff that there is is what, what you might call men things. You know, there's a lot of action, there's a lot of shooting, there's a lot of science fiction stuff. It doesn't seem, it seems to be very much like, in that sense, action adventure, American action adventure movies. There's, there's not as, well, there seems a, to be the, ma the main emphasis. Well, you've only seen a small amount of Japanese True. animation, mm -hmm. and there's a tremendous variety of the genre. It doesn't only take take men things, action adventure. It doesn't only take science fiction. There is a whole plethora of sports shows where it's soccer teams, football teams, baseball teams, uh, science fiction sports. There are made up sports. Um, there are romance adventures. There are a tremendous amount of magical princesses shows aimed directly at five-year-old girls. There are mindless comedies that are directed. I know quite a few salary men who come home after a 10-hour day and want nothing better than to kick on the uh, TV and watch some mindless giggles, laughs, and strange relationships. Let's not forget the transvestite secret agents. Yeah. Oh, well, no, yes. we can't, yeah. can't forget the transvestite secret I mean, That's a favorite agents. genre of mine. Padalero. 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 That is a mind twitching show. Well, there's a lot of Japanese animation is directed at different age groups. There's right. some stuff for children and yeah. lots of wild comedies for the teenagers and the sub-adults. You'll get a lot of soap operas. You'll also get a lot of science fiction action adventures. For the adults, you'll get some really far out comedies and you'll get some stuff that might be a little more adult theme. Mm. That's interesting because you don't, that's one thing you don't see much of in this country is animation directed towards adults, it's, except just for pure nostalgia purposes. You know, like Who Framed Roger Rabbit mm. was meant to evoke something for, for people when they were growing mm. up. You don't see as much, animation in America is considered kid stuff by its that's very the, nature. Yeah, that's in the first half here. of this century, animation in America was mostly aimed at the adults yeah. and to a minor extent aimed at children. It was only during the second half of this century that animation became kiddie trash. <laughs> well, especially um, in World War II, animation was strictly for adults. Yes. There's yeah. stuff that's banned on most TV networks because they can't show them because it's adult theme. But you're right, the perception in this country that animation has got to be for children has really played hob with the Japanese material that they've imported. Mm -hmm. Because they'll bring in a series that was done for teenagers, college students, adults, and they'll go, it's animated, so it must be for children, and then they'll go, good heavens, this has got sex, death, and drinking in it. And they will go in and take out key story yeah. elements because they don't feel that these story elements are appropriate for children and they presume that because it is animated children are the only appropriate audience. It's, it's almost mm. a self-perpetuating problem that I think is being broken just now by the hardcore um, Japanese animation fandom 
that's getting started in this country. Well, not that's getting started. It's been going for almost two decades, that's but that's getting yeah. burgeoning yeah. as of now. Yeah. The problem is that it's been Americanized instead of looking at what's being shown. One show that a lot of the concepts have been changed was what was called Star Blazers that made sort of a second comeback for Japanese animation. Uh, they drank sake on a show. It's, it's thrown out as mineral water when they give toast to heroes. And a lot of things are just basically thrown out because it doesn't, to the censors here, doesn't fit they, for they that type of area that they want to show here. They spend a lot of time visiting the grave of their friend who was just wounded and got out fine right after the camera stopped rolling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you'll find people with like 40, 50 holes in them, and then the next scene they're, they're alive. They're, they're just a flash yeah, and, the an, and the animation is just a little off in that scene somehow. Yeah. Yeah. All during the 70s, it was a lot harder to address certain adult themes than it is now. Nowadays, when cartoons are brought over or even made for, for this market, in this market, there are, there's much more that's being admitted to and being talked about in today's yeah. cartoons than there were 10 years ago and 15 years ago. Yeah, actually, if I could specifically for a second blow the horn of a project I'm associated with, mm -hmm. um, the Akira, which, by the way, I don't exactly translate. I work with a translator and write it into English. Ah, I had okay. to say that or she would hunt me down and kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when that was brought over, um, Mr. Otomo Katsuhiro, who was the original creator of the project, was insistent that it not be licensed in America to anyone who was going to attempt to bowdlerize or to westernize it. So, you know, I mean, this has actually been an eye-opener for a lot of uh, movie studios in that all of the Japanese names have been retained. I work on the comic, but this is for the film as well. All of the deaths have been left in, and it is quite a uh, popular and successful property, and suddenly we're hoping that people are going to rethink, well, gee, Maybe we can acknowledge that this is Japanese made and about Japanese characters, and maybe mm -hmm. we can acknowledge that people die. And uh, they must have also noticed that it is not elementary schoolers, it's college kids and adults mm -hmm. who are going to see this. So I'm kind of hoping. Yeah. One of the uh, best films done, uh, Naushka in the Valley of Wind, yeah. was brought here and changed to Wars of the Wind. They cut 15 minutes out of that, and some of the best music and flying sequences in the film were just thrown out. And they changed the whole, Why the names of the characters. Sequences? There were flying sequences. She, Naushka, which is one of the, it's a Greek name, which is one of the daughters of uh, Poseidon. Mm. She is representing a, uh, a prophecy of a flying uh, savior for the planet that's being ruined by radiation and poison. But a lot of that is missed because of there's 15 minutes cut out of film. And the Japanese spent a lot of time on their characters, the music, right. uh, some of the detailing. It's amazing they, they do half animation, half frame animation as we do, but yet their the way they present their stuff is much better, much nicer. The Japanese animated films and TV series have lower budgets than their American counterparts would. Uh, Joe mentioned the movie Akira. With a budget of 1 billion yen, that is the most expensive animated movie ever made in Japan. That works out to less than $7.7 .7 million at yesterday's exchange rate. And uh, I didn't check the newspaper. That, well, yeah, that's dirt <laughs> cheap still. Yeah. 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 American cartoons these days will cost $20 million, $30 million mm -hmm. for an hour or two hour long movie. Why do they cost so much? I mean, are there... There's an ugly reason. Do you want to hear it? Sure. Oh, sure. This okay. is the place to tell I will, it. I will not name the name, but <laughs> one of my friends who has worked his whole career in animation and who was getting out at the time he told me this yeah. said that um, there is a pernicious setup in the American animation industry that the blue-collar jobs are done with, by a union group that has a lock. In the terms of their contract, they are not paid a guaranteed rate they are paid a guaranteed an enormous percentage of whatever the budget is. And if the budget goes up, that is merely more money for the people who were dusting off the cells and sweeping the floors. And in order to be able to pay the animators more, you have got to come up with such an inconceivable amount of, jan of money for the janitors that um, it's no longer cost effective to do really good animation in the United States. Which is not mm. a problem, which is, mm. I assume, why they're farming so much of it out to That Japan. is why yeah. things are being done in Canada, in Japan, by little bitty non-union shops, right. by Korea. Mm. I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable situation. If you know, we had about 
eight or nine animation companies in the United States. We're down to about three that actually do work and two that just distribute work. And after everything else is done out of the country. After more than a decade of shrinking, the American, American animation industry is finally starting to expand. They're starting to hire new animators. They're starting to branch out a little bit. It's interesting to note that a lot of the new young talent, the writers and directors who are coming into the American animation market, got their influence when they're growing up watching imported Japanese animation. <laughs> yeah. And the Japanese animators who were doing the animation, to a certain extent, got their influence from Dr. Osamu Tezuka, who started the comics and animation industry in Japan yeah. after the war. He got his, his influence from American yeah. directors. So it keeps coming and going mm -hmm. around. It's like it's like Akira Kurosawa movies. He you know he based his he based his things on westerns, and in turn his movies get made into westerns. It's mm -hmm. like it back and forth constantly. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. It's great. Well, yeah, that too. The arts <laughs> are the most international <laughs> community. No, I've noticed um, in a, in America there are, I mean there are some um, some. Um, animation that's that's still being done but you sort of have to go down to the village to to see it and it's you know playing for a couple of weeks and you have all these adults who come in and they kind of go oh yeah this is great you know a bunch of adults but it's just small enough to fill one theater i am getting several signs that we are yeah, yeah. We supposed to, to be wrapping up now so so Keith. oh this week um we're going to be at icon at suny and stony brook we're going to have a table set up that's april 19th to the 21st at the indoor sports complex look for us Yes, come over and say hi. Um, next week's topic is getting your fantasy and science fiction published. We'll can, see you then. Can we do it? Can you do it? I don't know if this is possible. This week marks not only our 25th episode, but also the 23rd anniversary of this guy. He's been around for 23 years. Keith, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and the one, and the two, everybody. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Keith. Happy birthday to you. No, I thought the conversation was a little short. Did you? <laughs> I don't know why. It proves that can last more than 25 years. Ladies and gentlemen, good night. And we'll see you at Icon. I hope so. Why not? This episode was sponsored in part by Comics Interview, the magazine where both the fans and the pros turn to see who's who and how it's done. For a free sample copy or a special discount on any Comics Interview publication, write to Comics Interview, 234 Fifth Avenue, Suite 301, New York, New York, 10001. Omega Zone, a store specializing in comic books and video movie rentals, located at 46 8th Avenue between West 4th and Horatio in Manhattan. Telephone, 212-645-6941. Icon 10, the East Coast's largest convention of science fiction, fact, and fantasy, to be held April 19th through the 21st at the State University of New York at Stony Brook on Long Island. Meet actors from Star Trek and Doctor Who, Dean Stockwell from Quantum Leap, astronaut Deke Slayton, authors Harlan Ellison and Dan Simmons, and nearly 200 other fascinating guests. For more information, call 516-632-6460 or 6472. Angels Down, Fans to the Rescue, Fallen to Angels by Larry Niven. Jerry Purnell and Michael Flynn, a new best-selling SF adventure from Bain Books, coming to a bookstore near you in July. Mm -hmm.